So here's where we're going. You can turn to Genesis. We're going we're gonna to start a series that will take us several weeks. I'm not sure quite how many yet. It just depends on how this goes. But we're going to call this the problem of evil and the goodness of God. Okay, the problem of evil and the goodness of God. And a few reasons why we're going to have this series. One is just some things I've been thinking about. And if I'm thinking about often I think, well, this may be helpful. It may resonate with you and, and maybe answer some questions or cause you to, to wrestle in some ways that would be beneficial to you in terms of grappling with how you understand God and how you understand yourself and how you make sense of the world that we live in and your life and the storyline of your life. So we're going to talk about the problem of evil and the goodness of God. We're going to be in Genesis, but I want, I want to say as we get started this morning that our theme is, and if you were in Sunday school this morning, the adult Sunday school class, you heard a lot about this. Our theme at our church has been for years that, that God is good and, and he is gracious and kind and and merciful, and even when we think about the other attributes of God, God's justice or God's wrath, things like that, that those are not in contradiction to the goodness of God, but they are in harmony with the goodness of God. And 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 we we believe we believe at, at the from the depths of our hearts that that God's goodness is is our greatest hope. That 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 is the reality first of all, and it's our greatest hope and our greatest struggle when it comes to our fallen condition. Our greatest struggle is our struggle to believe that, that by nature we all rebel against our maker, we mischaracterize him, we, we judge him to be not good or things that he does to be not good, and that underneath all of our sin is that state of mind or state of heart. And that's the true sin condition. And there are things that we do that are sinful, for sure, there's sinful actions, but beneath it all, at root, that is the fundamental problem, that we fail to see the goodness of our Creator. We fail to trust Him. That's our emphasis. We talk about it all the time. And, and His rescue is, through the Gospel, the good news of what Jesus did in coming to this world thousands of years ago, living in our place, dying in our place, dying for us, saving us. That is, when we come to believe that, that's the beginning of the awakening to the reality that God is in fact good. That is evidence that we are being persuaded by our Creator that He is good. That's what the Gospel conveys to us, and that's how it imparts life to us. Spiritual death is that false belief, that deception which says God is not good, and spiritual life is being awakened to the reality that He is, in fact, good. That we can trust Him. So that's our emphasis, that's our theme, we talk about it all the time, but when it comes to our lives, it's often difficult to believe that He's good, as I said earlier, and that's our fundamental problem. And, and you may know, if you've ever studied theology or studied philosophy, or if you just think your way through life like most people do, you may have bumped into what philosophers have traditionally called the problem of evil. The problem of evil. And the way it's framed is, is like this. If, if there is a God who is all good, then he must not be all powerful. Because if he's all good and evil exists, and we all know evil exists, it exists within us, it exists in our world, it exists in terms of things that human creatures with free will do, evil things people do, which stem from that fallen heart we talked about a moment ago. It exists in that sense. And then there's this other category, philosophers refer to that as moral evil, and then this other category referred to as natural evil, which speaks of like natural disasters and diseases and and all the horrible things that happen in this cursed, fallen world. So there's this problem of evil. Well, if there's this God who's supposedly all good and all powerful, something doesn't seem quite right. Because if he's all good, then he must not be all powerful because he must be powerless to stop evil because he doesn't stop evil. So there's that contention. Or the opposite would be, well, he is... Um, he is all powerful, but he must not be all good because he does not choose to use his power to eradicate evil, which means he himself must be evil in some way. So that's known as the problem of evil. Some people use the term theodicy. I don't know if you've ever heard that word before, but theodicy, which, which deals with, and this is really interesting and really important, the term theodicy kind of helps us understand the root issue here. It really deals with the question of God's rightness. 
uh, theodicy, theos, from the word for God. The, the, the last part of that word, uh, dice, which is from the Greek, dike or dikeosune, which is the righteousness of God. So it's the question regarding the righteousness of God. Is God right? And many atheists would, would grapple with this question and say, well, God must not be, if he exists at all, I can't believe that he exists because if he did exist, he would not be righteous because I don't like the fact that I look into the world and there's all this evil and wreckage and brokenness. So theodicy, it's this, it's, it's, here's what it is. It's people sitting in judgment trying to figure out whether or not we're okay with the way God seems to be. And what we're going to talk about throughout these weeks is the thing that we need the most is almost to flip that around. Rather than our tendency, our natural tendency, which is to sit over God and sort of tinker around and try to figure out and make our assessment of Him, but what we need really is the, um, we could call it anthrodicy. The, 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 the righteousness of man is the real question. If we can sit under God's teaching and, and actually question not Him but ourselves, we can actually be helped. And so the problem of evil, and we're going to hopefully be persuaded week in, week out, that God is, in fact, good. The problem of evil and the goodness of God. And to get your minds going even more, I have Jack, uh, he's, he's queued up a video here. I want you to watch this video, okay? And I want you to think carefully of what's being said. Let me set it up real quick before you play it, Jack. The man being interviewed here is a, he's a well-known British comedian, writer, actor, director, and an outspoken atheist. And you may have seen him in certain movies before, or you heard his voice. There's a lot of voice work, even for the Harry Potter books and things like that. So he's kind of a well-known, successful, but very intelligent thinker and an outspoken atheist. And I want you to hear just two minutes here of what he says about what it would be like if he dies and it turns out that there is a God, what he would say to that God. So go ahead, Jack, play it. Oscar believed in as he died, in spite mm. of your protestations. Suppose it's all true, mm. and you walk up to the pearly gates, and you are confronted by God. What will Stephen Fry say to him, her, or it? I will basically, what's known as the Odyssey, I think, I, I'll say bone cancer in children? What's that about? How dare you? How dare you create a world in which there is such misery that is not our fault? It's not right. It's utterly, utterly evil. Why should I respect a capricious, mean-minded, stupid God who creates a world which is so full of injustice and pain? That's what I'd say. And you think you're going to get in no, on that? but I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to get in on his terms. They're wrong. Now, if I died and it was, it was Pluto, Hades, and if it was the 12 Greek gods, then I would have more truck with it because the Greeks were... They didn't pretend not to be human in their appetites and in their capriciousness and in their unreasonableness. They didn't present themselves as being all-seeing, all-wise, all-kind, all-beneficent. Because the God who created this universe, if it was created by God, is quite clearly a maniac, utter maniac, totally selfish. Totally. We have to spend our life on our knees thanking him? What kind of God would do that? Yes, the world is very splendid, but it also has in it insects whose whole life cycle is to burrow into the eyes of children and make them blind. They eat outwards from the eyes. Why? Why did you do that to us? You could easily have made a, a creation in which that didn't exist. It is simply not acceptable. So, you know, atheism is not just about not believing, there is a, is not believing there's a God, but on the assumption that there is one. What kind of God is he? It's perfectly apparent that he is monstrous, utterly monstrous, and deserves no respect whatsoever. The moment you banish him, your life becomes simpler, purer, cleaner, more worth living, in my opinion. That sure is the longest answer to that question that I ever <laughs> got in this entire series. <laughs> okay. It's kind of intense. So I imagine you're thinking lots of things feeling lots of things. And to be honest with you, I, I wrestle with it. When I heard him interviewed, I heard a longer interview, and I found this clip. Wrestled with it, felt lots of things. Part of me can feel 
a, a disdain for him and kind of almost a defensiveness of God. Maybe you feel some of that. We're all God-fearing people here. Wouldn't be here this morning probably if we weren't. So we can feel that. And then on some level, and this is where I, I wonder if you can meet me here. On some level, what he's saying resonates with me in the sense that, yeah, there are things that I don't like about this world. I mean, I looked it up. It's true. There are these worms found mostly in Africa that burrow into the eyes of children and render them blind. If that's you or your son or daughter, how do you feel about that? Probably not super happy about it. So think about that. I know for me, and I've talked about this here before, but when I became a Christian, it was in my young adulthood. I was 19, 20 years old. First time I cracked the Bible and started reading and thinking through it and came to believe in, in Jesus. And, and I believe that was genuine and I was converted at that time. But unbeknownst to me, what was happening is I was even migrating into the church and then went off to Christian college and seminary from there. Didn't realize it. I feel like it's more clear to me now, but I was, but I was migrating into an environment in which I thought I was going to be sterilized and kind of insulated from some of the evils of this world, some of the darker realities. But the longer I live, the more I think through things like that. Hardships in my life, losses in my life, and day in, day out, week in, week out, I meet with people, mostly Christian people, not always, but mostly Christian people, who are wrestling with the dark realities of life in this world. Broken relationship, broken marriage, betrayal, disease, cancer, tragic accident. And it's one thing to think about these things like theoretically or philosophically. It's an, quite another thing when they touch down in your life. And what we come to realize is, even as followers of Christ who have been made alive, if we're honest, in our humanness, yes, something in us does not like God or the way He chooses to operate in this world often. I hope you can see that you are not all that unlike Stephen Fry, and neither am I by nature. And, the, and, the, and we need to see the goodness of God and we need a miracle to take place for us to see, first of all, that that is our fundamental condition. That is our disposition with regard to our Creator and all it takes is the right circumstances to bring that out of us. I mean, did you hear, did you hear his language? I mean, what are the things that he said about God? For one, The first thing he says, like, how dare you? Called God evil, stupid, maniac, monster, And it would be easy to say, well, I'd never say those things of God. I, in the right circumstances, I, I bet you would. There have been times in my life, things have happened when evil has broken through in a way that I did not anticipate and did not like, that whether I spoke those words or not, I'll tell you right now, that's what I was feeling coming out of me. So, so I want to be, um, in my life and, and the people that I fellowship with, I, I am eager in... in, in interested in deep thought and contemplation of every part of life. As I talked about last week, life is complicated. It's a mix. It's up and down. And, and how do we discover the goodness of God in the midst of all that up and down? And, and not to deny it, not to ignore it, not just to do the Christian fantasy thing of just trying to escape it, but just face it. And I believe there's great help there if we, if we can go there. So for a few weeks, we're going we're gonna to delve into this. And this morning, we're going to be in Genesis. And I just want to do this. I want to go from kind of the, the beginning of God's story to the middle to the end. That's where we're going this morning. Beginning, middle, end, and kind of big picture stuff. And then in the following weeks, we'll go into more specific passages. We might spend a little time in Job, some time in the New Testament, in the Gospels, in Jesus' ministry, and just deal with, grapple with this problem of evil and how we can actually come away from that seeing more clearly the goodness, the goodness of God. So, so Genesis 1, here's what I'm going to have you participate a little bit. So this is going to force you to stay engaged. Uh, I'm going to read Genesis 1, verses 1 to 31. And I, I want you to, as I'm reading, I want you to see if you can, sometimes by inference, but like what can you say about the character of God from Genesis 1 and what I read? What are things that you can 
infer from what is spoken here in Genesis 1 about God's nature, about God's character, okay? So as I read, you give that some thought, and then I'll come around to asking you what you saw and, and sort of where you saw it or heard it, all right? Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning one day. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning a second day. Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them, and it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning a third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens so to, to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. It was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. Then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind. God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. There was evening and there was morning a fifth day. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind and the cattle after their kind and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which is fruit yielding seed, and it shall be food for you and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the sky and to everything that moves on the earth which has life. I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. All right, so that's Genesis chapter 1. What did you observe about God's character? What can you conclude from there? So go ahead. What did you see or hear? God is fill in the blank. Good. The word good is used over and over and over again, declaring what he has made good, which by virtue of that fact would indicate that the one who made all this good is himself good, and he has good designs and good purposes and good pleasure in what he's made. So, okay, so God is good. What else? God is blank. What else? God is creator, okay? He's clearly the one who made all these things, okay? What else? All-powerful. God is all-powerful. I mean, if he was able to create out of nothing, that's magnificent power, isn't it? And could we add, I'll just go ahead and add, 
Uh, along with that power, he is intelligent. It, any of you who have spent any time trying to build even something simple know that it takes a lot of intelligence to build. And if you've ever studied engineering or architecture, there's a lot that goes into it, a lot of math that goes into it. And, and so God's intelligence is on a level that is truly remarkable, isn't it? To be able to create and have the power to do that and have the wisdom and the intelligence to be able to do that. So we could say God is all-powerful. God is intelligent. Uh, what else? Uh, triune says, let us make man in our image. So it speaks to the fact that there are more than one person in the Godhead. Not three gods, one God, but three persons sharing the same nature and sharing the same purposes. What else? That's what I heard. In control. Okay, so if he made all of this, then he's in control of all this. And incidentally, just for fun, when it comes to the theodicy question, that philosophical question, really what's most in focus there is the character of God in terms of, well, he must, God must not be all good. Because if he made everything, then it only makes sense that he would at least be able to control what he's made, even if he gave humans free will. I mean, still, you could say he could stop things from happening. Because he has the power to make it. He could clearly stop things from happening, evil from happening. So really the issue there, it seems like at root, is really, is God really good? Nah, it seems like he's evil from that philosophical or atheistic perspective, okay? So... So, okay, there's that, there's that matter. Anything else you would say? Uh, when you think of that, maybe I'll give you a hint. When you think of the fullness of all that God made and then putting Adam and Eve in this creation, and he talks about the fullness of the plant life and the fruits and the, all these trees and vegetables and then all these different animals of all different varieties and everything is very full. What, what does that say? I mean, what is this condition? Who was earth made for? made for man and woman and for us. And it was suited. It was fashioned particularly for people, for, for men and women. And he says he, he gave them dominion, right? And, and he says, go and subdue the earth. I mean, man is the, the pinnacle of God's creation. He's the apex creature, given the greatest degree of intelligence and ability and strength, and not the strongest of creatures, but the combination of intelligence and strength and skill, certainly at the highest level, right? And he's given dominion. And so everything was made and furnished for Adam and for Eve. And so can we not say, can we not infer from that that God is generous and he is sharing of all these things with his creatures? And, and notice chapter 2, actually a few sections in chapter 2. just want you to see when it comes to God's generosity here. Look at verses 7 through 9 of chapter 2, what God says to them. As so the Lord formed man from dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There are all these trees that are good for food and pleasing to the sight and and look at verse 16, the Lord commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely. And the language there is actually emphatic. I remember looking at one of my Bible study tools and pointed out that you could translate this, you may eat freely or you may eat to your heart's content. Like, enjoy. It speaks of God's lavish generosity. You see, you see that there in this creation account, in the same world that you and I live in today? That's all good, and in some sense, we can, we can agree that that's good. But it's complicated, isn't it? Because this same beautiful, wonderful, full world, with all this abundance, is also a world in which there are hurricanes and tornadoes and floods and in which people die and there's cancer and all sorts of diseases and diseases that just eat away at humans' neurological systems and every other part of man. So man, we just, we, we become decrepit and weak and, and we all die in one way or another. And that too is part of the world. So man has got this, I mean, it's amazing to think about what we creatures can do with our minds and with our bodies and we can walk and we can run and we can jump and we can build and create and, and we get old and tired and weak and we get injured and 
we destroy. Sometimes instead of building, we destroy and we attack and we exploit. So it's complicated, isn't it? Often when you, when you hear evolutionists talk about the world, they say, hey, look, there's this apparent evidence of design. It looks, the world looks designed, but there's a problem because look at all the things that go wrong. I mean, what kind of design is this when there's tornadoes and hurricanes and cancers and things? But it's not that, I mean, God addresses that. He accounts for those earthly realities, doesn't he? Because it, where it goes from here is it says, hey, here's what happened. With all that God gave Adam and Eve and all that goodness and all that generosity, he said, there's one thing you must not eat from is one tree. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is representative of the fact that it is not good for you, Adam and Eve, or fill in your name here. It's not good for you to live and depend upon and feed yourself on your own knowledge of good and evil, it, it's not good for you to be, to usurp the position of the creator, for you to be the authority, for you to be in charge. You are a creature and the best place for you to be is under the authority and provisions of your creator. And if you, if you rebel against God, if you, contrary to what Stephen Fry says, if you banish God in that sense, that is death to you. And then God says, hey, the world now will be cursed. And so you move into chapter 3, and that's what you have, is you have the curse. And God says to the woman, I'm going to multiply your pain in childbirth. And to, to Adam, he says, hey, the ground is cursed, and in toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. And then toward the end, he says, hey, you're, you're going you're gonna to die. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. And so there's this reality of the curse. And the world is a world of great order, but there's also this disorder to it, which is all this cursed reality, which is evidencing the fact that something is not right. And, and what's not right is not God the Creator. That's not really the question. He's not the subject when it comes to what's right or what's wrong in this world. What's really out of order is creatures, humans, me, you, our heart's disposition toward our Maker, where we go with that, all the perversion that emanates from that fallen, depraved mind. That's the problem. And God gave us plenty of evidence that something is wrong. So one way to think about the existence of evil in this world is, hey, yeah, identify it. We're all aware of it. It's what makes life scary, all the horrible things that can happen. And, and there is this evidence that basically don't get too comfortable here. Yes, it's good. Yes, it's full. There's so much to be thankful for. And when you bump into the other more dark sides, the things that you have so much difficulty deeming good, realize that those two are by design to help you see that there's more and that you need something at a deeper level and you need rescue. So there's the Garden of Eden, which is a paradise, which is filled with pleasures, but also pains with provisions but also privations and that's the reality the complicated reality of the world we live in and then you go from here after the curse God describes the curse and then in chapter 4 you have the first murder Cain killing his brother Abel and then in chapter 5 and just show you because it's interesting it's so clear here the way things go in a fallen, cursed world. Chapter 5 lays out this genealogy, and when you read it, you go from Adam and Eve to their descendants, and over and over again, if you were to look, and we're not going to read it, but if you were to look, even just surveying it, you can see over and over again, it has these words, and he died, and he died. So it's this genealogy that mentions all these people, and then it says, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. So God is not hiding from us the reality of death. It's very obvious. He is accounted for it. It is part of His plan. It is part of His design. All with the intention of inviting creatures to accept the reality of life in this fallen world and the reality of our condition in this fallen world. So that's the beginning of the story. In some ways, just scratching the surface, but then there's the middle of the story, and you know the coming of Jesus. He comes, the Creator who is Himself participating in creation with God the Father here. He comes into the created world, and He comes in the body of a creature, though He is the Creator. He comes in the body of a creature to experience this world, to experience many of the, the good, pleasurable parts of life, many of them, and all of the unpleasant parts of life. He experienced all of them. 
from broken human relationships and betrayal, as you know, to even a body experiencing pain and, and disability as he was beaten to that point and then dies, expires in this world. And so Christ comes as, as a man to live in our place, as our substitute. And he comes in the whole time, unlike us, he, he doesn't question the goodness of his father's plan. He doesn't rebel against it. He, he doesn't look at what God says is good and call it evil like we do. He, he calls it all good. He knows it's all part of the good plan. And he submits to his father's plan. And he's trusting in his father implicitly the whole way through. Even when he goes through the worst of experiences in this cursed world. And he dies. And then he's, three days later, he's raised from the dead to give hope for that which is beyond, for new life, for the higher life, than even the life of the garden, than even all the abundance of the garden. No, the new, like higher life, life in, with, through God. It's resurrection. And then you read, turn to Romans 8 with me. You read where Paul talking about the world we live in and kind of this limbo state we're in for now. Romans 8, verse 18 through 25. Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him that is God who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruit of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. This hope says, I'm lo it's looking forward, and it says there's more, there's better. It looks to God who is the creator of all things and the only one who can redeem and restore all things. It says that in this life, we're in this creation that is groaning, like the, the birth pangs of, of, a, of a mother waiting to give birth and there's these painful contractions and the world we live in is filled with such contractions. I mean, it's not a day that goes by. You don't hear some item on the news, whether it's a whether it's an example of the category of moral evil, of people doing horrible things to each other, or natural evil. We had recently a, a building collapsed and I think close to 100 people in Florida died so far. They've excavated or dug out 100, almost 100 people, floods, they've killed people recently. I mean, those things happening and reminding us of how fragile we all are, right? Paul says here, there's this, there's this longing, this waiting for future redemption and future restoration. And then we'll look there one last point passage here, Revelation 21. This is the end now, the story. So we've gone from creation to Christ coming and the cross, and, and then there's the end. And in the end, this is what we see. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 5, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. God is living with men, and he will dwell among them. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, and there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. 
Notice what he says there. There's this new creation, and most importantly, you see where it says over and over, God is among his people. God is with his people. That's what the coming of Christ was showing. You know the name Emmanuel. It's used often at Christmas time. It's God with us. That's been God's intent from the beginning. It's been his design from the beginning. And we, like Stephen Fry, our nature is to banish him to go our own way, to depend upon ourselves, to trust in ourselves and our own understanding and our own under, our own knowledge or just judgment of what's good or not good. That's, that's our nature. And we are plagued with the consequences of that. And God has even filled the world with the consequences of that. And that natural evil category are these evidences that something is not quite right. And it's not that something, it's not the theodicy question really it's not the question concerning God's rightness. It's the question concerning ours. And God invites us to, to do what is naturally just in some ways unthinkable. I mean, when you're touched with evil, you're diagnosed with a disease, suffering of some kind, or a broken relationship, or betrayal at a deep level, and you just feel like everything's falling apart. Naturally speaking, there's nothing in you that says, oh, I want, to, I want to listen to what God has to say to me about himself in this. But because God is lovingly committed to persuading us that he is in fact good, he reaches us. He communicates gospel truth to us. He says to us, even in our anger and our resentment and our rebellion, he says to us, I, you're forgiven. You're my son, you're my daughter, you're, you're precious to me, you're valuable to me, you're loved. I mean, even what I let you go through, when I, when I providentially let those evil things, there's evil inside of you, that's your biggest problem, and then there's evil outside of it that touches sometimes, and it hits that evil inside of you. When that whole like crucible happens, God is there as a loving father. Your, your life is not meaningless. I'm, I'm reading another book, I think I mentioned it last week, The Happiness Hypothesis, and it's also written by, he's not quite the angry atheist that Stephen Fry is. He's more of an agnostic. He's more agreeable to the things of Christian doctrine named Jonathan Haidt, although he is not himself a believer, at least not yet. Seems like he's maybe grappling with those things. But but he says at one point, he's they're finding when psych, psychology, psychoanalysis, um, that with people, man, they need a meaningful story. People need a meaningful story. I just, we just, we just looked at the meaningful story. And it accounts for everything. And then they say, hey, when it comes to like finding contentment or happiness, that, that on some level there has to be meaning. And God has been revealing the meaning. Himself, his purposes, his redemptive plans, his inclusion of the ingredients of both those things that we easily deem good and even those things that we have a hard time deeming good, but they're all ingredients in this meaningful story of redemption in which God is inviting us to himself. And I'll, and I'll close with this thought. I love that the name Israel in the Old Testament, you may know the story where Jacob wrestled with God and God changes his name to Israel. And, and there's a little bit of a debate about what exactly the name Israel means, but it, it has to do with, for sure, the idea of wrestling. And there's this concept of, at least by connotation, of God wrestling with man and man wrestling with God. So here's what the gospel, the good news of Jesus, invites us to do. It invites us to wrestle with God as we will in this fallen world as small, finite, limited creatures. To wrestle, to be honest about that part of us that has, that's right there with Stephen Fry saying, God, how dare you? To, to wrestle with God over what he allows, what he does. Uh, to wrestle and, and to rest. And we look at Christ and we see what perfect righteousness looks like. We see his submission, and we see Christ even accepting death itself, knowing that his Father will raise him from the dead. And we learn to accept the things that, to use probably a, not the most accurate phrase, but the things that life throws at us, which is a way of saying the things that God ordains for us to go through and allows us to go the author of the story, the things that he's written into our stories, to, to learn to accept the complicated mix that it is 
the ups and downs, the things that, again, we would easily deem good and the things that we don't. And to know that over it all, there is this great God who is good and kind and generous. And the curse and fallenness and all those hardships in this world, it's not the end of the story. There is more. Behind them, there is a kind God who has redeemed, rescued us, who has eternal life for us in fellowship with, abiding with us and us with Him, which is what we were made for. So the problem of evil and the goodness of God, we kind of touched on it today. I hope it's been helpful to get your, your mind thinking about some things that are important to contemplate. I hope it's I hope it's struck a chord with that new life in you that says, yes, God is good. He's been good to me. The fact that I exist, the world I get to live in, the ups and the downs, but yes, God is, God is good and Christ is my hope. My sin is forgiven. My rebellion is forgiven. The, the resentment and the hostility of my heart that would plague me to oblivion has been addressed by Christ and covered and atoned for. And there is now this relationship that is firm and invincible because of God's loving grip on me and on you. And I hope that ministers to you where, where you're at, whatever you're going through, because every one of you could tell me about your, your life story, your meaningful story, and parts of it that you're probably not crazy about. And I hope that you can wrestle with God there and find rest in this overarching truth of who He is and His goodness to you. Let's pray. God, thank You for Your Word and what it clearly reveals about Yourself and us and Your plans for creation. This world of fullness and fruitfulness. This world of great pleasures and provisions but also pains and privations and difficulties and disease and disaster and death of all kinds. God, please humble us. Help us to accept our small position as creatures, dying creatures really in this world. Help us to accept what we so fight against in that place to find rest, peace, and the fruits of, of your Spirit purchased for us by Christ and get granted to us in Christ love and joy and peace, patience and goodness and kindness and gentleness and self-control that you would cause us to experience your life, God. Taste and see that you are good to believe you when our nature is to disbelieve you, to have an accurate view of your character when our mind wants to distort your character. So thank you for Christ, God, and the blazing display of your glory and your rescue of us. Thank you for the time we've had this morning and pray that as people are thinking through things that you would bring clarity, help to their hearts and minds as only you can. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.